everyone and thank you. And I'd like to thank Bournemouth University for inviting me here to share my thoughts on race relation 50 years on. I'd like to start off by saying that this is a big subject and I can only skim over it as I feel I would not be able to do justice. We're going to start with um, the Windrush. I think most people start from the Windrush. At the time, there was a mass immigration from the Caribbean that started in 1948 with the, with the, with the Empire Windrush. Immigrants were mainly from Jamaica and they, at the time they had high employment. The ship, the ship left Jamaica on the 24th of May and arrived at Tilbury Docks on the 22nd of June, 1948. Some of the passengers were men who had worked in the armed forces during the World War II and traveling to rejoin their unit after, after leave and others were going to join up. I want to say a little bit here um, about, because I came here in the 60s, but my stepfather came, um, I think it's probably about late 50s. So he used to t um, talk about what it was like for him when he arrived here. So he wasn't on the Windrush, so he came much later. And he would talk about his accommodation, what it was like for him being here for the first time. And you used to hear stories about, um, especially around the men, because was, I think it was mainly men, some, some families came at the same time, but they, because of how accommodation was for them, they used to share um, like rooms. So they used to have some people who would work like on different shifts. So you'll have the day shift and you'll have the night shift. So when the day shift has gone to work, the night shift will come in and take those beds. And that is how um, that they lived. And one of the things he said to me also was that um, because of how the accommodation was and and especially when this, this, this thing about no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. Um, so it's very difficult as um, people from the, um, who came over to find anywhere to live. And, and for him, he's always said that he didn't have that experience like many people did. So he was one of the fortunate ones that he managed to get a room. So, but the only thing that is, is the, um, the landlady would not allow is for him to have any women um, <laughs> to visit him. So. Mind you, at the time, he, he did have somebody who, who he intended to marry, so just as well, he wasn't allowed to do that. <laughs> um, okay, so 1948, the, the, Nation, the, na the Nationality Act encouraged um, the venture of open door policy for the Commonwealth Im um, immigrants. So as long as you had a British passport, you were seen as a citizen, so you were able to sort of um, travel here. The new immigrants had many difficulties um, on arriving in Britain. Accommodation was a major one, with temporary shelter being found in the deep underground in Clapham Common, and that was previously used as a bomb shelter and to house prisoners of war. Brixton became one of the, one of the areas in, um, in London, so it's the nearest place for work and, and to socialise. Many of the arrivals found work around the country, but many of them mainly remained in London. Then you have um, the Race Relations um, Act 1965. The Act aimed to prevent racial discrimination. The Act was weak, in my opinion, as a piece of legislation. It only spoke of discrimination in, in, in specifying public places, for example, hotels and, and um, restaurants. So anywhere else you can be racist apart from in those places. There were evidence of race discrimination in housing and employment. The National Front activities and offensive comments made, um, made by the likes of Enoch Powell, who was, a, who was a conservative member, where his speech was dubbed the, riv the river of blood. And many people would have known about um, Enoch Powell even though at the time, I don't think it was him, but you'd have people travel from the government who go to the Caribbean saying, please come, come over to England. We need you to help build our country. We need you in, the, in hospitals. We need you to um, the buses, the railway. So people was encouraged to come, but at the same time, when, when they did arrive, how in, in hospital was the country um, towards them? We also had the Race Relation um, Act 
1968. This one attempted um, to, um, it, it was designated as an international year for human rights, um, quoting from the 21st section of the UN General Assembly Resolution 2142, the Subcommission of, on Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities is undertaking a special study of race of race, racial discrimination in, in um, the political, economic, social and cultural fields and has already appointed a special rapporteur for that purpose, reaffirming that race, racial discrimination and apartheid are, denied, are denials of human rights and fundamental freedoms of justice and are offensive against human dignity. Those are strong words. But who took notice of those words? So as we know, um, racist incident continues. You also have the Racial, uh, Racial Discrimination Act, 1976. In 1976 Racial Relations Act, there seems to be some consensus where employment were concerned. In the same act, Roy, Roy Attersley, a Labour Party member, had much to say about immigration and the people traveling to Britain. He's quoted to have said in his speech, we must impose, we must impose a test which, which will try to analyze which, immig which immigrants are most likely to be assimilated into um, national life. Now, when I read that, then I start sort of looking at questions. So we can see here, it's not just the Conservative Party who were concerned, but it was also Labour. The question is, how do you test who will integrate into society? Over the years, many people have played their part in the act. It has been over 50, 50 traumatic years since the Windrush arrival to the pre-2000 Act, where there were no protection of equality for those experiencing racism, either at work or in housing. There used to be several local race, um, race equality council offices around the country that would provide support for those experiencing racial discrimination. I'm glad to see that Dorset office is still active, one of the 21 that I was able to find on the internet. Since most RAC offices are now closed, it was not only the, the, the local offices that supported racial victims, but also the Commission for Racial Equality, which is the CRE. I view um, the CRE as having no teeth. I remember back in 93 when Stephen was killed and I met at the time was um, who is now Lord Oosley, who was the chair um, of the CRE and we were on a radio station together. And the questions I think for me, Stephen's murder was seen, well it, it wasn't, uh, is um, a race murder. But the CRE wasn't able to do anything. I mean, you know, they didn't come up to meet us in the first or invite us for a meeting. So my only opportunity of speaking to the chair at the time was at, um, we were doing a radio interview together. And like the time around Stephen, I felt that there was nobody I felt that I could go to or have a support because Stephen's murder was a racist murder. So I didn't have, and, and the CRA did, did not provide that for me. So now that we have the, um, the Race Relation Amendment Act 2000, and this is after Stephen Lawrence inquiry, one of the ways that the Act was different from the last one 19, for the 1976 Act was to, in, was to inset discrimination by the police and other public authorities. I would never have thought that the House, the House of Parliament was outside the 1976 Act. I knew about the police, but not about the House of Parliament. And you think they're the ones who are there 
making laws that governs the country, but yet the act did not cover them. And just like the police, they could be as racist as they like before the Racial Relations Act Amendment 2000, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. But now, if it wasn't for Stephen's case and Stephen's the inquiry, we would never have had the change, which is what we have now. So, you know, there's been many changes since Stephen's murder, and this is one of them. As I said, I can't believe that the, us as a parliament, it wasn't part of it. How do they make laws that's supposed to govern a country and a society if they too don't observe and act in the way in which they should around race relation? Okay. <laughs> um, the 2000 Act also talked about monitoring when it says the Secretary of State should appoint a person, not a member of their staff. I take it to mean an, ind a, an independent person should be appointed. This is seen as a statutory duty of the state. Now, how do we know what monitoring is taking place and who's, who's doing the monitoring? I know after the inquiry we had, um, I think every year there was a publication of um, what out of the recommendation that should be should have been in, implemented. But they still, if, if I was to think about it now, I have no idea where we are now or what monitoring has been done. There's never been, there, there's no report to tell people exactly where we are when it comes to um, the amendment act that they introduced in, um, in, in 2000. In October 2007, the, the Equality and Human Rights Commission was set up to replace the CRE. Um, to replace the CRE, the um, Disability Rights Commission and the, and the e Equal Opportunities Commission. Now, I don't know how many of you know about all of that, I'm sure it's not publicised in a way that gives people an understanding of what the Equality and Human Rights Commission stands for. It's only because I'm looking to do this talk that a lot of these things are coming to light for me it's by reading and having some, some understanding. Having a commission, it all sounds good on paper, but in my view, they are like the CRE. No teeth. Um, when the... Because we had, as I said, we had um, Oman Usley who was a chair. And when he stepped down, then you had Trevor Phillips. And I remember meeting Trevor Phillips just before he took office. And one of the things I'm talking about, always saying, is about in an organisation, I expect you to be able to carry out certain things. And, and that, that includes um, where um, discrimination is happening, casework. Those are the things that people need to happen for them if there's um, whatever experience that they're experiencing. And one of the things he said to me at the time is that don't take me by my take, don't take me by my work, but take me by my deeds. But for me, I can't see exactly what he's done since. In fact, he's no longer um, there. But I couldn't see what he was doing. He he, ha he has an organisation they're supposed to be supporting, you know, and making sure around race relation. Now, if they don't do casework. Where does people go? And if all the, the local um, race equality offices are closed, what means does individuals have in other when they're experiencing racism or discrimination? Where do they go? So people have less and less places to go and that they can get support. Since, since the... Um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. There have been some improvement in the fight against racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and the related intolerance. Back in 2001, there was a world conference looking specifically at racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance. However, we all know that we have a long way to go. 
there was some good that came that, that came at talks um, from the conference. And then we had September the 11th. And I, I remember that really, really clearly because I was at the World Conference back in 2001. And I think I, I arrived back here either the Sunday or the Monday. And September the 11th happened on the Tuesday. And all the good things they talked about at the time of the conference, what they intended to do, and the fact that we had practically all the countries. The, we had the Americans who were saying that they're not going to turn up. So all they had, they had no official, but they had NGOs who was at the conference. And all the little islands, like Jamaica was one of them, that spoke at the conference, you know, they, they saw this as a way of moving forward. But once September the 11th had happened, that was it. No more talk about um, the World Conference. And I think my only time I've heard about the conference again was about two, three years ago when they had a, a, a meeting um, over in um, Geneva. And that's the first time they got back together again to talk about the, the World Conference that they had back in 2001. And still, I feel nothing much has happened with that. So we have not moved forward since then. The previous um, national and international laws uh, enacted in numerous treaties to ban racial discrimination have, have therefore been adapted in the 2000, in the 2000 um, Act. Apartheid um, have been defeated in South Africa, yet the talk about racial discrimination and the effect still goes on. From the Stephen Lawrence Inquiry published in February 99, there were 70 recommendations. And I would like to mention two of these recommendations. And I feel it related to the subject. Recommendation 12 gives a definition of a racist incident as, a racist incident is any incident which is perceived to be racist by the victim or other persons. And the other one is recommendation 68. Local, authority, local education authority and school governors have the duty to create and implement strategies in their school to prevent and address racism. Now, I think when, um, after the inquiry, when McPherson used the word unwitting as well around racism, it's like, what does that mean about being on, that you're unwitted when, unwitting when, you, when um, a racist remark or something? has happened. And I always question that because I just think, for me, it's not a strong enough word. And does people understand what it means? Because at the time, I certainly don't understand um, what, he, what he was trying to say. And also around the schools, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Racist incidents in schools, it's this, it's this, it is so important for young children to have some understanding of the words that they use or how they behave in school. <laughs> And one of the questions I asked after around schools is that, how have they reported about racist incident within the schools? And I don't think that they, they have, haven't, haven't really done that. One of the reasons why some, um, I was told is that because if they were to report and publish, that parents will think twice about sending their children to that particular school. So, it stops them from doing it, but at the same time, if you don't publish it and if people don't understand and if the school themselves don't accept it, because without accepting what's happening, how do you change it? So you need to be able to do something in either for, people to, for schools to know that children need to understand and parents need to understand. Because I think children at times, I've always said no child is born a racist. And so it's just something that they learn. So if you're not able to address it, address it in school for parents to understand, then how do you move on from there? Now that most of the schools are no longer under local authorities, but are academies, do they have to comply with the McPherson recommendation on the role of education in, in the prevention of racism incident in schools? The question for me at the time is that, what authority um, like the Ofsted have over um, academies? And um, no, they're not part of the local authority. And that's one of the questions I thought about that 
it would be a sensible question was to ask in the house of the floor, um, on the house of the floor in, in the chamber. And then one day somebody did ask the question to a minister. And I was trying to think the other day, did he actually answer the question? And most of the time when you sit in the chamber, even when you listen to what's happening in the House of Commons, you know, MPs will ask the Prime Minister a question, but he never answer. The question goes round and round and round. You never get a clear answer. So for me to say to you um, exactly who it is that um, when now that academies are not part of the law, um, part of the local authority, what role does Ofsted play, and how how strong is their hand when they come to um, academies? Because as you know, academies they're not say a law unto themselves, but they're a, they are a unit to themselves. They're not part of a whole. Um, local authority. So I think for me, the verdict is still out on that one. On the 22nd of October this year, the Home Secretary addressed the National police, the Black Police Association about progression of black officers in the police force. First of the recommendation of the Stephen Lawrence inquiry is that the ministerial priority established for all police service to increase the trust and confidence in policing amongst minority ethnic community. Now, during the time of the inquiry, you would have um, a lot of people giving, making rec recommendation um, to the inquiry. And one of them was the Black Police Association. Now, you always had black officers uh, within the force, but it's how they're treated within the force and how long do they stay. So at the time, the inquiry talked about quota to increase the number of black um, police officers in the force. It is not the number of police officers, black police officers, that is the problem. It's the culture. Once they're in the force, that's what I see as a problem. As I said, last Thursday, um, the speech by the Home Secretary, Theresa May, is no surprise to the black officers about the progression for them. I've said a little bit about the inquiry, but we're about to have a, a second inquiry, and this time is looking into corruption. Now, I've met the, the Home Secretary quite a few times, and for me, I believe it's the first time that I've known a, a conservative Home Secretary that you were able to talk to her, her, her level of understanding of what's happening within the police force. The fact that um, when, after the court case in 2012, I had a meeting with her, I think sometimes I can be, not rude, but very cheek, cheeky when I um, speak to some people. So I just think that they have no level of understanding of what it is and how they behave towards normal people. And one of the questions I felt that during the whole 20, only 20 years of Stephen's case, it's not been where the Prime Minister, the Home Secretary, nobody have said, well, I'm really sorry about your son and this should never have happened and this is what we're going to do. But I find that Theresa May was completely different. And when I saw her just after the, the court case and I said to her, that we've had a conviction, we've had two conviction, and the Prime Minister didn't even write to say, well, this has happened, I'm really pleased that after so many years that something's happened about your son. And she said to me, I'm sure he did. I said, I'm sure he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think she's trying to make excuses, and I just think, no, because at, at the end of the day, I feel I've got nothing to lose. They've taken my son, I've got nothing else to do. I said, I've got two other children, but, you know, I, for me, I just need to make sure I get my point across. And she was very good at listening, I must say, she's very good at listening. And so when we went to see her, because I've always said that Stephen's case is one of these cases that it seems as like if there's no end to it. We had these two conviction and I kept thinking there, has, there is something, I don't know what it is, and I can't say, that I think this and this need to happen. 
So when we had our first meeting with um, senior police officers, so everybody's sort of going back how the, the, the court case went and people sort of giving their verdict and stuff. And I said, I think they think I should sort of put up and go away now. And I said, I'm sure there's much more that we don't know everything that's happened from the night of Stephen's murder until now. And Cressida Dicuzzi, who was the, one of the assistant commissioner, she looked at me, she said to me, what do you know? I said, I don't know anything, but there's something, I just feel there's something still that hasn't come out. And what do we know? Then we heard about the undercover policing. Did I know about that? No, I didn't. Corruption has always been something that we within our team have always felt that the police officer back in 93, they didn't act and behave and treat us as if we were victims. We were treated as if we were perpetrators. And that's what the bit I couldn't understand and why, and I presume now you're looking back because if you were treating us as victims and you're looking into Stephen's murder, you would have caught his, um, caught his killers because they had information, people giving them names, and what stops them? So for me, it was racism as well as corruption. But we had nothing to prove for those things. Then during the inquiry, we would hear about names like Davison, John Davison, who is a senior officer, and he was involved in the case. And you hear about his link to one of the families. So that went on and on. So, but still, you can't prove anything and there's no way the police is going to give you the information. So as I said, having somebody like Theresa May, who seems to have some understanding and some empathy, because I think without her, this next public inquiry that we're having would we'll never have it. Because, you know, to have one and then to have two is extraordinary. So we don't just have the public inquiry, we also have the IPCC, which is Independence Police Complaints, um, who are also looking, they're looking at um, John Davidson and others. And we also have the National Crime Agency. So there's three investigations happening now. And none of that would happen. And I have to say, I'm, I'm the one that caused all of that. Because when I went to see the Home Secretary about the, having a public inquiry, he's like, no. And in fact, all her aides around her would want to say to her, well, there's nothing more they can do. But it just so happens that the last time we went to see her, we had Michael Mansfield with us. And this was looking at the corruption. So we, we did not know about the undercover policing at the time. And he had his notes and he said to um, um, some of her aides, look, this is my notes. I can leave it with you so you can take a copy of it, but I want it back. So the next, so the next time we, when we went to see her, I think she still expected, expected to say no, but it was, then she decided for us to have a review. And the review, I could say, no, we don't want the review, we want a public inquiry. But I thought, if that's what we're gonna have, then that's what we'll take. And from the review that Mark Ellison did, QC, loads more things are beginning to come out and apparently when she got the report, this is rumours, that she was quite livid in the Home Office when she got the report. And so the report was announced in the House of Commons because I think that allows them to allow, that they're allowed to make announcement without anybody being prosecuted. And because of the stuff was in there, Mark Ellison could be. So it was announced in the House of Commons. And the fact that she heard, well, the report was able to tell her about the corruption that took place, officers involved. So all the time that we were talking, even though we couldn't put our finger on what it is, the evidence was there. So hence why she's called for the public inquiry. And the um, undercover policing, I, mean, I don't know if all of you would have heard about when, about two years ago, when it came out that um, officers who had used dead children's name and having a relationship with um, protesters, children. And so even though they've been trying for how long to have a public inquiry, it never happened until the undercover came out around our family 
that during Stephen's um, case, that this particular officer, um, Peter Francis, he would task as an undercover agent to infiltrate the campaign group. So if you think about, you know, just this one case, you know, people say it costs millions of pounds, but if the police did their job in the first place, it would never cost that amount of money. So when people sort of look into, look at us as a family, that we're the ones where all this money's been spelt, spent because of all this inquiry, this investigation, had the police did their jobs, it would have been done and dusted, what, 93, 90, um, 93 94? And here we are, 2015, and we're still talking about it. Okay, I'm always surprised when I hear Conservative min Minister lambasting police, uh, the police force for their shortcomings. As I say, you don't hear that from the Conservative. You never hear that. They always support the police. So the fact that Theresa May is doing that, and you know, she's taking the initiative to recognise when things are not right and want something to be done. Long may it last. I'd like to finish by quoting, um, this was um, back in around 2001, Mary Robinson, who was the United Nation High Commissioner for Human Rights. This is what she said. If the World Conference is to make a, make a difference, it must not only um, raise awareness about the scourge of racism, but it must lead to a positive action of, um, at national, regional and international level that can bring relief to those who bear the brunt of racism and racial discrimination. This is a subject that requires firmness, resolve, discipline, persistent, persistent action and clear, clear sight, clear insight of thinking. Most people agree Racist, a racist is not born, they develop, and the primary cause of racism is ignorance. As the UN Secretary General said on the occasion of the, of, of, of the observance of International Day for, it, for eliminating race, racial discrimination on the, 12th, the, the 21st of March, 1999, ignorance and prejudice are, are, are um, and maidens of propaganda. Our mission, therefore, is to confront ignorance with knowledge, bigotry with tolerance, isolation with outstretched hands of generosity. Racism can, will, and must be defeated. Thank you.